don't get hooked. At least that's the theme of this week's show. There is a lot going on in the fishing world. We've talked recently about social media and what's going on there. Well, I've got some real world examples of what to do. newsletter every week, uh, you, you should have noticed in there my very first article. I've been doing this now for a few months. My wife kind of got on me to do it, but uh, she's helped a lot, and we have been doing it every week. It's my featured tip, and this week, this is, of course, the theme is don't get hooked, essential tips to shield yourself from fishing attacks. Now, I understand some of you guys don't want to sign up for a newsletter because you already get too much stuff. This isn't a newsletter. This is my insider show notes. And uh, yeah, okay, it, it, technically, I guess it's a newsletter. But in reality, what I'm doing here is finding the most important articles of the week. It's usually six to eight of them and putting them into my insider show notes. And I send it off to the various radio stations that I appear on. Some of them carry my regular radio show. Some of them do not. But it is basically the simple but you can get all of this without subscribing if that's what you want to do. If you really, really, really don't want to get my insider show notes every week, then don't subscribe. But here's what you can do. Go to my website. Now, the problem is if you don't get the email, you might not remember. But if you go to craigpeterson.com, you'll see on my homepage, it's divided into two sections. And the sections have... First of all, my podcast, so you can listen to my shows. It's right there, and I, I really I appreciate you guys listening to it. And you can also subscribe there, but uh, that's the first part. The second part is called The Latest, and this is the latest articles that I've written. So what I just referred to, which is my featured tip of the week, those are all right there. So it's about halfway down the screen. You'll see it right there. And what you should look at in conjunction with this week's show is the don't get hooked. And I've got a picture of a fishing hook going through a piece of email. And if you're wondering what that looks like, well, you'll be able to tell when you get there. And then I also have another one that I wrote called Don't Take the Bait, Unmasking Fishing Scams Targeting Small Businesses and How to Fight Back. So if you're a small business owner or someone working there, this is something that you're going to want to pay attention to. So let's get into the Don't Get Hooked article that I have up there. The FBI is estimating that phishing scams now have cost businesses and consumers over $12 billion in the last five years. That's almost real money. It's certainly not to Congress, but it is to you and to me, right? In 2018 alone, the FBI received over 2.2 million complaints about phishing scams, with losses totaling over $1.2 billion. And they have a special website set up that you can go to to report some of these scams. And I got to tell you that in reality, they don't pay a whole lot of attention to most of these reports because unless it's at least $20,000 that you've lost, they don't pay much attention to it. And that's from personal experience helping people out, listeners to the show that have been scammed. Now, what should you be doing? Be very wary, and, and I think most of you guys are, right? You're pretty cautious, but be very, very cautious if a website is asking you for any sort of personal information. A lot of them are asking for email addresses, and in fact, you can't get around that. They, they absolutely require it, and that is such a problem because once you're giving them your email address, that's kind of the key to the front door, or maybe it's the key to the screen door on your house, depending on how you want to look at this thing. But once they have that key, 
and they're able to open that first door, the second door gets easier to get through. A lot of websites do this the right way. And the right way is let you create a user ID. Don't worry at all about your email address, at least not initially for that initial sign up. It's worth pointing out that these passwords that we have, our email addresses, etc., are often stolen by the bad guys. And that's part of the reason that it makes a lot of sense to try and change up your email address every once in a while. And obviously, do not use the same password on every website because that can really nail you as well. So, what is phishing? It's really, think of it as a scam. And what it's trying to do is get you to do something against your own best, you know, uh, worth the best for you, interests. So it might be trying to get you to click on a link and then that link's going to download malware and then that malware is going to actually be ransomware and then they're going to steal your data, then they're going to encrypt it and then they're going to tell you that if you don't pay extra, they are going to release your own personal data. Those are all big problems. And it's not as obvious as the Nigerian scams. You might remember those pretty clearly because with the Nigerian scams, you would get an email that was just terribly worded. And it's usually some Nigerian prince or princess that, that needs access to your US bank account in order to run money through. And they'll go ahead and they'll make sure that you can keep some of that money that they're gonna transfer through your account. These things nowadays are much harder to detect. And they're not just showing up in your email box. These phishing scams are now showing up in text messages and elsewhere. I had a listener who contacted me saying, hey, uh, Craig, uh, what do you think is happening here? And it was a scam. It looked very, very legitimate. I've had, in fact, quite a few that have contacted me. I had a, a lady who works for me whose friend had sent her a text saying that she had been kidnapped and was being held for ransom. And they need, she needed to pay up and transfer this money. I think actually in her case it was, you need to go and buy a card, gift card, and tell us the number on the front of the card and just scratch it off on the back and tell us that number as well, or we're not going to release your friend. And she had the presence of mind to go ahead and make a phone call to her friend who said, I'm fine, I don't know what's going on here, because the bad guys had faked the address, which is the phone number of her friend's phone. So it looked like it was coming from her friend, but it wasn't, was it? So that gets to be a problem too, because when we are under stress, when something's happening like that, we don't think straight. And we're making all kinds of mistakes when we, we have it happen. So the bad guys are just playing all of these games, psychological games. And the grammar that they're using isn't as bad as it used to be thanks to AI that's out there. So here's what you should do. If you think you might have received an email that is potentially from a bad guy, look at the email address and look at it really, really carefully. And some of the scams out there, like the one that Barbara Cochran's person fell for, had a, a one letter difference in the email address. So look at it, it might be you know, Craig at CraigPeterson.com, that's probably me. But how about Craig Peter S0N? Are you going to notice the difference? Same thing with banks, etc. Sometimes they'll put a dash in the middle. Or they'll make it look like they've got a bank name or Apple or Microsoft in there. My dad fell for one of those scams as well. And the, the bad guys got his Excel spreadsheet that had all of his banking information in it, all of his passwords in it. And I had warned him about that in the past, okay? Look at the content because sometimes there still are spelling and grammatical errors. There might be some really weird formatting or just very, very generic greetings or greetings that we don't use over here on this side of the pond. Legitimate companies 
usually proofread the emails. They'll use personalized greetings, and it'll be hi or just your your name, Craig, comma, and off they go. That's in fact how my emails come out. That insider show notes I was talking about earlier. That's how that shows up for you. Check for suspicious links. Now, an easy way to do that is usually to just hover your mouse over top of the link. And it'll show you down at the bottom left-hand corner of your browser window the actual URL that you'll be sent to. Now, there are some ways around that, so you've got to be kind of careful. A lot of businesses have special email link checkers. So when the email comes through the business email server, it automatically says, hey, wait a minute, what is this? It double checks it, checks the reputation of the website, of the link, and hopefully keeps you safe and warns you about it. Verify the information. I like to just contact the company directly. So if I get an email from the bank, I'm not just about to hit respond or call the phone number that they've given me. I'm going to look up the bank's phone number. The way I do that, you look at the back of your debit card card or credit card, and you'll see right there a phone number that you can call if you have questions. So do it that way. Don't just hit reply or call the number they gave you. One of the dead giveaways is urgency. It will seem like, oh, you've got to respond right away. They're trying to trick you into taking action quickly. Why? Well, because as I mentioned, When your brain isn't working quite well as it should because you're under stress, you're going to make mistakes. So check for urgency. That's another sign that that might be a bad guy in a phishing email. Make sure you sign up right now, craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. Get those insider show notes and my tips for free. We've got a couple more tips here about phishing and we're going to tell you what to do if you've been a victim of a phishing scam not just received a phishing email but you've actually had money stolen from you or from your account and then we're going to get into something i've never seen before I have all of this information on my website if you go there, craigpeterson.com. Now, I'm reminding you of that because I'm not going to give you the phone numbers of what to call. You can find them on my website. Just hit that search button if you don't see them on the homepage, and you can find it. It's a pretty good search feature, and you will get to the right places. Now, I want to really emphasize this because this happened to my father. He was trying to get some help with his Microsoft computer. It was misbehaving. So he looks up on Google, Microsoft Assistance, Support, and he calls the people up. And the first thing they ask for is a credit card. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's the last thing I ever asked for, I guess. You know, it's because I'm a much, uh, much less of a great businessman as I am a kind of a tech guy. But he gave them the credit card and gave them full access to the machine. And so my stepmother was looking over his shoulder at the time this is all going on, and she saw them opening up his spreadsheet that had all of that information in it. It had his uh, his bank account numbers, passwords, everything right there. Obviously a huge, huge, huge problem. So she called me up and got my son on it and right away got that thing fixed and shut them down. Well, how did he get into this trouble? By going to Google and finding Microsoft support. That's why I want you to go, if this happens to you, if if you become a victim of phishing, I want you to go to craigpeterson.com and hit the search button and type in phishing, which is spelled, of course, P-H. I-S-H-I-N-G, and then you'll find I have a few articles up there about it, and I have direct links on where to report some of this fraud. So the first place is the Federal Trade Commission. That's the first one I have listed here. This is a government agency that's supposed to protect consumers from fraud and scams, and boy, howdy, I've dealt with them before, and I have not been impressed. But That's the first place you go. It's reportfraud.ftc.gov. Then there's another one that's kind of interesting. It's called the Anti-Fishing Working Group. 
This is a nonprofit organization that's working to combat phishing attacks. So they will take phishing scam information. A lot, you know, it'll do a lot better with those guys than it will with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, obviously, if you've had money stolen, then, wow, then you got another problem, right? Uh, the, then the last one that uh, you can go to, and this is a kind of a complaint thing. How do you file complaints with the federal government? Well, there's a website out there that you can go and file a complaint, and I've got a link to that too. But reality is they're probably not going to do much for you. Where you should go is call your bank, call your credit card company immediately. Now, if the bad guys have already taken money out of your account, what you do is you also are going to have to file a police report with your local police department. Get that police report number because you might need it later on. A lot of times the banks, other financial institutions will require you to give the police report number because filing a false police report is a crime in and of itself. So they look at it and say, well, if uh, you had filed something with the police department, it's probably true because under the law, you could be prosecuted and serve jail time if you file a false police report. So it's important to contact the bank, the credit card company, the financial, financial institution, and then give a phone call to the local police or law enforcement agency that you might have. Now, when you are reporting a phishing scam, you want to include as much information as possible. So keep a copy of the email that you had responded to or the text message you received, whatever website that you visited, any personal information you may have entered. Put all of that in because they are going to need it. Now, I should point out too that you guys are the best and brightest, and you probably won't fall for one of these scams. You know, you might. But I want you to know all of this stuff so you can help your friends. Because my friends come to me fairly frequently with these types of scams and these types of reports. So keep an eye out for that. So screenshots, if you have them of the phishing email or the text message, you've got to include those with your report. And if you have any information about the identity of the person or the group, that sent the phishing email, make sure you include that with your report as well. So detecting a phishing attack is very important. I've got an article about that on my website as well. And I've got one about vishing, V-I-S-H-I-N-G, which is a voice phishing scam. And they are very problematic nowadays because voice scams are easy enough to generate. All they need is a few seconds of someone's voice. They can get that off of, what, TikTok and YouTube and all over the place. We're, we're leaving our voices everywhere. And that can then be used to make a fake phone call or, you know, some sort of a message that they're going to send to you. In fact, just this week, we had one of these types of, of scams. And there have been many in the past. But a, a fake recording, fake voice scams are huge. There's a company... I think it was in the UK that had been bought by a German firm and the CEO of the UK company got a phone call from the, the head of the German company who told them they needed to pay this invoice for one of their suppliers, right? Uh, but it was fake. It was absolutely fake. And part of it's due to the whole generative AI stuff that's out there. But there are a lot of technologies that let you do it right now. People are already losing money from this. Uh, McAfee was saying 77% of victims in AI-enabled scams lost money. That's how good these scams are nowadays. And more than a third of those victims lost more than $1,000. It's a real, real problem. Uh, original scam, here's one. They... Someone calls pretending to be the police, claiming a friend or family member needs money quick to get out of legal trouble. We mentioned that one already. Now, using AI, the scammer can actually pretend to be someone's child or other relative. They can get a, a very close facsimile of the real relative's voice without a whole lot of trouble. 
legitimate tools are letting the scammers now respond in real time as they type out sentences in the voice cloning apps. I don't know if you watch um, American Idol, but was it Idol? America's Got Talent is actually, I think, what it was last year. And there were some guys that had a cloning app, really, program. They had a bunch of computers, a whole little rack that they brought with them. And they had a guy singing opera, and they had him up on a screen. Well, the big, big screen. And they made it look like it was, and sound like, it was Simon Cowell who was singing. I think is who it was. Uh, and they've tried it with a, a few other people out there. So it, it, it's reasonable. I've talked before about the South Korean artist that was scammed out of something like $100,000 by Mark Garofalo. At least she thought she was talking to a Hollywood movie star who needed some extra money because, you know, he didn't make enough money off of those Marvel movies. And she got scammed. So be careful. It can happen to anyone. This technology is very easy to use. The art attacker doesn't have to have any expertise in artificial intelligence, and you can be scammed. So we, we keep your cockles up, okay? With this is a this is a problem. Make sure you get my email. You'll get this week's newsletter as well as future ones for free. CraigPeterson.com. I know they're insider show notes. There was a vulnerability this week, unlike any that I've seen before, and it's a lesson for each one of us. And it's very, very concerning because we're seeing new things all of the time. But uh, man, this zero day is something else. You might be wondering what I mean by zero day. A zero day flaw is a flaw in a piece of computer hardware, software that is being exploited by a bad guy. But it's a flaw that there is not a patch for, usually because the manufacturer or developer of the software or hardware, usually because they do not have knowledge about the vulnerability. So some of these systems that are out there have had holes in them for years. There was just a recent one where it had been eight years that this data was exposed and that's definitely a zero day because nobody knew about it. Well, there is always another reason to patch, isn't there? And a patching can be good, it can be bad, it can certainly be a major pain for everybody involved because particularly with Microsoft Patch Tuesday, things can break. We just got a call this week from a client who all of a sudden their Google Chrome browser wasn't working and they needed to use Chrome for this one specific website because some websites are just coded up poorly, right? And it wouldn't work. Well, it turned out Microsoft Patch Tuesday had delivered a patch that caused problems with Chrome on her machine as well as some others. So patches are important and in fact that's why I'm working on my Patch Aware product so you know which patches matter because we're talking about dozens of patches released daily sometimes. It's, it's just overwhelming, frankly. Well, there was a patch that was released that, fall, that fixed a problem called CVE 2023-2868. So that tells you something right there because we're talking about these vulnerabilities for the year 2023 and they're this is vulnerability number 2,868 as of May 20th. That's when that one was released. Okay. That give you an idea of how many patches come out, come out almost 3,000 by May 20, 2023. Well, this patch was installed by people, hopefully, for the Barracuda firewall. This is where things get just mind-blowing because we know, okay, so there's a vulnerability. Yeah, it's a zero day. Yeah, we've had those before. Well, in this particular case, Barracuda is saying, saying um, um, if you have our email firewall, you need to replace it immediately 
full replacement. It is not patchable against this flaw. And this flaw apparently was exploited starting in October the year before. Wow, hey? Eh? So I've never heard this before where a vendor is urging its customers to just wholesale rip out and replace, not patch these affected appliances. So they need to be replaced immediately regardless of the patch version. So a lot of people are switching over. We've had some interest in our Cisco email filters, which we have and we use for our customers. But Barracuda know that, knew that sort of thing was gonna happen. So Barracuda is now telling you, if you are using their product and you've been happy with it, they will give you a new one for no charge. So that's a pretty big deal. The, the hard part about some of this is, okay, so how do I configure the new one? What happens while I'm waiting for the new one to arrive? What do I do in the meantime? What do I do with all, all of the emails that are coming in that might be compromised, right? It, this is always a problem. It doesn't matter who the vendor might be. Now, as of June 2023, Barracuda is saying that about 5% of their active email security gateway appliances have been hacked. And it's called an indicator of compromise due to the vulnerability. Rapid7, who's another cybersecurity company out there, called this stunning and said there appear to be roughly 11,000 vulnerable email firewalls connected to the internet worldwide so what one of the things rapid seven does is they kind of scan the internet and see how things respond so they know who it is so if you have a barracuda email firewall get rid of it immediately get a new one or switch to something else depending on what you want to do but i've never heard about that before have you but it brings up the whole issue of zero days and the fact that we've got to be very careful again when we're applying patches because like this what happened here with barracuda apparently it's been exploited since october right and they said as of may 20 i think it was hey you've got to replace it so that's october to November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Are you counting along with me? That's seven months. So when the patch comes out, it may be zero day. The patch may just have come out, but that doesn't mean that it isn't urgent that you patch it because it's been exploited for seven months. Exploited means the bad guys are using it. And with something like an email spam firewall, you gotta figure that they are probably gaining access to the email. Doesn't that make sense? And one of the goals of malware is that it's hard to remove. The great little comment here by Nicholas Weaver, he's a researcher over at UC Berkeley and this suggests, according to him, that the malware compromised the firmware itself to make it really hard to remove and very stealthy. That's not a ransomware actor. That's a state actor. In other words, that's somebody like a government, right? Whether it's North Korea or Russia or Iran, there's a lot out there. He says, why? Because a ransomware actor doesn't care about that level of access. They don't need it. If they're going for data extortion, it's more like a smash and grab. If they're going for data ransoming, they're encrypting the data itself, not the machines. So these machines were wanted by some state actors to, gain, to have permanent access to email is kind of the bottom line here. So what does that end up meaning? Well, again, think about, well, Hillary Clinton, right? Her email server that she had in her, her home and it was uh, not protected and it was very hackable and likely hacked by the Russians and others so they could gain access to all of her emails. Remember that whole thing? And then she deleted 30,000 emails that were under subpoena. She smashed and her, her staff, I guess, smashed 
their smartphones to remove any trace. I mean, to, yeah, I don't know why they would do that when they're under subpoena. But anyways, what do you think would happen if other people are using something like a Barracuda firewall, email firewall, security appliance, and that security appliance isn't secure? What a great place for a country to be able to go take over the email servers, poke around and say, oh, wait a minute here. We've got another Hillary Clinton, right? And it might not just be Hillary where they're looking for state secrets, but they're looking for you. And what are you doing? Who are you emailing? Are you passing bank account information? Is there some way that we can come after you? So we've got to be super careful and remember that just because the patch came out on Microsoft Patch Tuesday or just because the patch came out uh, today, it doesn't mean it's not urgent. And that's what patch aware, frankly, is all about. How urgent is it that you get something in place? I think that's absolutely huge. And remember, everything needs patches, including your little firewalls. All of your servers. Are you patching them too? Well, what we could go by where I, I don't have something about artificial intelligence and electric cars. And this is kind of interesting because it's bringing back memories of Blu ray versus HD DVD or maybe Betamax versus VHS. You know, historically we've allowed the market to decide who a winner should be and if you're old enough to remember when videotape recorders first came out you know the type with the cassettes not the reel-to-reel -reel ones if you, you remember those you re will remember sony betamax and of course vhs now betamax was the superior format as far as the resolution went and the, the tapes were a little bit tougher, the cassettes were smaller, all of that stuff, kind of advantageous, really, right down to it. And we had VHS, which tended to kind of clog up a little bit more. The mechanism in the players wasn't quite the same as what Sony had made. And who won that game? Well, you don't see too many Betamax tapes laying around, do you? But there's still VHS tapes kicking around. VHS won that. Why did they win that? Well, they did not win it because it was the best technology. It was good. It was good enough, I think is probably the better way to put it. That's why it won. And it had better marketing, really. That's, that's the reason it won. People caught on. It was easy. It was convenient. It was inexpensive versus the much more expensive Betamax recorders and players. And ultimately, obviously, the the uh, tapes themselves, if you bought a pre-recorded tape. So they won. And in that case, it's the, the bad guy one, right, <laughs> if you will. They, they weren't bad guys. It was just the, the less technically advanced version of videotape one. Blu-ray versus HD DVD. Remember we had DVDs? We still do. And DVD, the resolution is really good, especially if you've got a great player. The same thing's true with a lot of the streaming services. If you've got an Apple TV, wow, does it make even low-resolution streaming video look great. I love my little Apple TV box. But DVD didn't have the high def uh, that people wanted, right? People now want 4K, 6K, 8K in resolution. DVD didn't have that, so we had another battle. This was between two formats. Again, it was Blu-ray, which, as you probably know, won that battle, and HD DVD, which lost that battle. HD DVD was backwards compatible, had a, a whole bunch of really good things going for it, but again, the marketing won. Now we've got something entirely different when we're talking about electric vehicles. We have electric cars that are effectively completely mandated by the federal government in the U.S. These cars are being made using various rare earth elements, 
uh, including copper, which is getting harder and harder to find and harder and harder for to mine. And the, it is very, very polluting, the manufacture of these. And then we've got the batteries after the fact. What are we going to do with them? California has taken some of the batteries out of the old cars. The, the batteries aren't good anymore and has been using them to make storage for electricity for wind farms. I, I saw an article that I really chuckled at talking about the forest fires up in Canada. Not that the forest fires, that's, that's a terrible thing. And Canada, like almost all of the U.S., has not been maintaining the forests properly. But massive fire. And so there's smoke coming over the eastern U.S., uh, all, almost the entire eastern seaboard and other parts of the country. And the solar farms, this is the kind of the chuckle part, found that they lost more than 50% efficiency because of the smoke in the sky, right? It's just like a cloudy day, or in this case, a smoky day. So it's an interesting problem. But we don't have a competition going on. Toyota put their money behind hydrogen-powered cars because it makes a lot of sense. If you have cheap electricity and you can make that with nuclear power plants that are efficient and clean and will run off of the waste products from the old nuclear power plants for at least 100 years, probably 150 years here in the U.S., and they are intrinsically safe, so think what we could do if we turned up all of those power plants. They're reliable, aren't they? And then we can use that electricity to make hydrogen and have cars going down the street that the only output is water coming out the tailpipe. <laughs> How's that for amazing? And Toyota has also done some work on combustion in engines, internal combustion engines also that, that use hydrogen. Should that be the winner? I don't know. You, you don't know. We'll never know because the federal government is forcing it down a road, which makes you really think about what's going on here, who's making rich, uh, right, and follow the money, all of that sort of stuff. Well, right now we have another battle going on. If you have an electric car, there's one thing you have to do. It's the same thing you have to do with a regular gas or diesel engine. You have to fill it up, don't you? Well, there are multiple standards, if you will. CCS is probably the biggest one in use by most of the various car manufacturers that are out there. This is the combined charging system. And if you have an electric car, you probably know exactly what that is. It looks like the CCS standard for charging cars might be like Toshiba's HD DVD, and it's heading to the ash heap of history. Okay, so CCS is type 1 or CCS 1. It's used on practically every non Tesla EV charging station in North America. So it's used everywhere. So why, why am I saying that it might be going the way of? Betamax and HD DVD? Well, the reason is pretty simple. Ford announced that it has struck a deal with Tesla for Ford owners to be able to use Tesla's supercharger. Now, remember Tesla set up supercharging stations all the way from Portland, Maine, down to Los Angeles, California, all the way across the country? so that you can drive all that way with, give or take, 20-minute, 30-minute charges on their supercharging stations. So Ford announced that. They came up with a deal. Hopefully, hopefully it'll last. I'm not sure. I haven't read the contract, obviously, but hopefully Tesla doesn't back out. Remember, Tesla had offered to all of the car manufacturers to be able to use their patent for the charging technology and nobody took them up on it so now ford's taking them up on the charging stations gm not to be outdone is a also ran gm has now announced that they are going to be providing their cars with the ability to use tesla superchargers 
Isn't that interesting? Hmm. I think it's a, a great thing ultimately, particularly if the Tesla supercharger stays open. The problem I really have with these things is the amount of electricity that you need to run them. Huge, huge uh, power supplies. Some of these charging stations for these trucks now, these electric trucks, you know, the big ones, have a megawatt. One of them even has three megawatt charging capabilities. That's a lot of electricity. And our grid is not set up for it. It's it's so obvious that the federal government is just trying to scare everybody and drive everyone into electric cars at the same time. So obvious. Because what we should be doing is build nuclear, quit shutting them down. I'm fine with the clean coal plants. I'm fine with the clean wood burning plants. Let's eventually shut some of those down. But what we need is reliable electricity. We can't have what happened in Texas where they almost lost. They were literally a few minutes away from losing the entire grid, power grid in Texas. That's how bad it got for them. That's huge. That's a huge problem. And we're going to have those types of problems too. Power grids are going to burn out. They're not designed to handle that kind of electrical load going everywhere. Yeah, they are for going to a, an industrial area that is using a lot of electricity, but not to residential areas. So we've, we've got a huge, huge problem. We don't produce enough electricity. Look at Germany now. They've been shutting down plants. Now they're turning some of them back on because they are way down. They're 20% down on their electric production. And remember, they're using all of the green stuff, and it's not meeting the country's needs. California, Gavin Newsom, the governor, quietly signed a bill that extended the license for nuclear power plant out there yeah we need nuclear so why don't we look at this look at it logically scientifically now i i am a big believer in science but science is where you you observe something you postulate as to why you try and prove it or disprove it and then move on right because you've established something Sir Isaac Newton, amazing man, supposedly saw the apple fall from the tree and started working on gravity. We, you know what? We still don't know exactly what gravity is. We know how the, the effects of gravity influence us, but we don't really know what it is. Well, we look at what happened with the COVID-19 virus and how initially they were saying, oh, we've got a model and it's showing that we're going to lose two and a half million people within the first few months in the United States alone. And of course, that didn't happen. Later on, people looked at the code from this researcher and it's what we in the computer business call spaghetti code, a total mess. And it was totally wrong. And that's been true of the climate science for at least the last 40, 50 years. No questions about that. And there's lots of proof easy to find online. So why don't we take this one step at a time? Let's produce electricity. Let's produce oil, sell it to the world, use some of those profits to make our grid better, stronger, and then start looking at, okay, how can we efficiently and effectively make electric vehicles and other things? Not the way we're doing it now. Hey, visit me online, craigpeterson.com. Lots of great information right on the website. We've got to talk about automatic Windows updates because there are some dangers. There's some pros to it as well. It was in the newsletter. Hopefully you got that. It was in the patch aware section. But we're going to talk about what you can, should, and shouldn't do right now. The patch that we need to worry about is the one that is going to sink our ship right there's a lot of different patches out there i mean thousands or released tens of thousands every month and they're designed to do a few different things one of course to help perf improve performance to add some features 
but there's also the crucial ones for security. And that's what I've been trying to cover in my newsletter in the patch aware section to help everyone be aware of what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, how it needs to be done, all that sort of stuff, right? And we've got to be careful because the patches, yeah, they could help us with our cybersecurity. They could help us with performance, but they could also bring all kinds of unexpected headaches. You could lose data. You could have instables, un unstable systems, unwanted changes. Things just don't work anymore. And my gosh, that was really the case in the Windows world for a very long time. It, it still happens sometimes. A patch comes out and guess what? It decides it's going to kind of wreck things for you. Not much fun. The Mac side, it happens a little bit every once in a while. The iPhones have been just really great for quite a while with their patches, and they just happen at night automatically when it's plugged in charging. You can't ask for much better than that, and, and then they don't cause problems later on in the day. It's very rare that an iOS and iPhone patch from Apple causes problems. On your Android devices, you can expect problems if you get patches. That's frankly the biggest problem with Android is, okay, Android is made by Google. Google is concerned about cybersecurity. They certainly do keep a lot of data on you, and if you're concerned about your own privacy, you might want to avoid Google. But Android patches have to go from Google. First of all, they have to be written, right, by Google. And then they have to go from Google to the manufacturer of the phone. Well, remember, the manufacturer of the phone isn't really the manufacturer of the whole phone. Apple doesn't make their own phones. Samsung, you look inside, the parts aren't all Samsung parts even. So the phone isn't exactly that manufacturer's phone. So what they have to do now is they take that code that came from Google, the Android code, they then have to have people who work on the operating system to integrate some of the features that control the hardware. And when we're talking about controlling the hardware, of course, that's the main processor. That's the chip that controls the communications with Wi-Fi, the communications with the cellular network, the voice network, as well as the data network, the display, the touch interface, right? All of these things. And then most of the vendors, Samsung included, will go ahead and make changes to the user interface, that thing that you see, that you're touching, you're clicking. All of that stuff is coming from a, a vendor like Samsung. The underlying stuff is coming from a vendor like Google. And then a lot of the device drivers are coming from third-party manufacturers. So if you have Android, it's usually three to six months after a security patch comes out before you're lucky to see it. And most Android devices, last number I saw, it was about 80 plus percent can never receive a security patch because the vendor doesn't support them anymore. You think about that process I just described. That's a lot of work for a vendor. How are they going to do all of that for dozens or hundreds or thousands of different products? that are out there running, right? That have that vendor's name on them. They're not going to, they can't do that. It's just too difficult. And then you consider the smaller vendors and some of the vendors you definitely don't want to use from China and man, things get even worse because some of them are putting software in that is really anti-privacy and anti-security. So you know how I feel about Android and this is the main reason I feel that way about it. When the 4G LTE came out, I bought an Android phone, a top of the line, best you could get Android phone that had the 4G LTE in it. My son got one as well. We were impressed with the speeds. We were seeing faster than 40 gigabits a second when we were down in a couple areas in Virginia. It was just frankly shocking to see. But then we started having problems with the phones. And to get the service, to get the software updates, to get cybersecurity updates were crazy. So I just returned the phones to the mobile phone carrier and said, listen, these things are crap. 
let's uh, get ourselves an iPhone because I wasn't a big Apple fan, right? You know, Apple and uh, who's running Apple, what's their political bent. And so I just didn't want to deal with Apple. But my gosh, now that's all I kind of preach, frankly. And it has to do with these patches. So in my newsletter every week, and you know this if you are subscribed, I've been putting in articles that I've written that are specifically about patching things you need to do, when you should do it, what you should do. And I'm talking about articles that I've written, that Karen, my wife, has helped to write. And based on sometimes the topics you guys have asked me to write about. So we are monitoring the information that's coming out from the cybersecurity information arms of the federal government, of the various anti-virus, anti-malware, anti-hacker phishing companies, and the insurance industry, and kind of putting them all together on, okay, this is what you need to patch this week. My first one was probably a, a little over a lot of people's head. It was about that heart bleed bug, and I apologize for that. But listen, nine years after that particular bug was exposed and was fixed by most vendors, it is the number one bug right now for people breaking into computer systems. Now, you as a home user, it probably didn't affect you very much because if you kept your windows up to date, if you kept your browsers up to date, you were using a version of Secure Sockets, SSL or the HTTPS, that was not susceptible to this heart bleed bug. But man, it's a bad one and it's still out there. So if you have a website, a web server, if you're a business that's exposing some of your data online and is distributing it via SSL, make sure you update that. But that doesn't apply for most people. Most people, I think you're okay. But if you're using an old version of Windows that isn't supported anymore, a lot of people are still running Windows XP, running some of these old versions that are really problematic. Well, then you are exposed to the heart bleed bug. And it doesn't have to be as old as XP. It could be as old as Windows 8, right? Or, or something that hasn't been updated in a long time. And most of us don't update. And, and why don't we update? Well, it's the standard reasons. Who has the time? It gets too complicated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm trying to do with Patch Aware. And I, I really, really want your feedback. I want to know what do you need to know, what you need to do, or what you need me to do in order to help you be comfortable in applying the right patches at the right time. Time. I really want to know because I want to help you. No two ways about it. Because we are seeing incredible numbers of just regular people who are being fished and hacked and having millions. In fact, the last number I saw from the FBI was over $30 billion stolen. It, it, it's incredible. That's, that's real money. So you got to do the right thing. So what's the right thing? How can I help you with that? Please let me know. You can just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. I'll answer anybody's question. And people who have emailed me know that. Me at craigpeterson.com. Be glad to help you out there. And on top of all of that, make sure you get my newsletter so that you get these updates. And I, I promise you and we will run through what I wrote in the newsletter about Windows updates here. We'll get, get you some good information. But I, you got to uh, you got to be on the list. And if you are on the list, you can just hit reply to any of my newsletters. You are not going to get some automated thing that's going to try and sell you, upsell you, and then, you know, get you to buy the chocolate bar when you're standing there waiting to pay at the cash register, right? What I'm going to be doing is sending you some of my most important stuff, the stuff most people want all for free every week all for free because i really want to help you i hope i haven't beaten that horse to death here but but that's really what i want 
to do here to, to help everybody out. So when we get back, we are going to go through how to get the full potential of your computer, whether it's a Windows or a Mac, but we're going to focus in on Windows today because the Windows, of course, is much more popular than Apple. You've probably seen Apple sales numbers have been dropping, but so have Windows. Uh, that whole industry, you, know, you get to a certain point and people aren't buying it anymore. But we're going to go through automatic updates, the hero we all need. Talk about the pros, talk about the cons, and take in your questions. Me, M-E, at craigpeterson.com. Make sure you join me online. craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. We all need a bit of a hero in our lives, and you know, frankly, automatic updates could be that hero, but they could cause problems. So we're going to go through some real-world problems that I have been aware of or part of with automatic patching. Is this the hero you need? Is this a good idea? You've probably heard that turning on automatic updates on Windows is a good idea. First of all, Windows updates are only going to update what? Windows, right? They're not going to go ahead and update all of the other software on your computer. Some of the browsers, some of the other software will do automatic updates. All of it won't. It's just some things that will. So keep that in mind, first of all. But let's talk about automatic Windows updates, if you do have them turned on. There's three different types of updates. There's security updates. So these are available to all users, whether or not you've actually paid a subscription license. Now, Microsoft has moved from a, you pay 100, 200 bucks for Windows, and then when it's time to do an upgrade, you, you pay that again. They've moved from that to a subscription model. So that now you're paying 25 bucks a seat, depends, right, on what level you're buying and everything else. But of Windows 365, plus your email, plus some security enhancements, all of that stuff. And I, I think that's not a bad idea, frankly. It helps keep the company in business, gives them good cash flow. I don't like it myself as as a reseller because there's no money to be made in that. But, you know, there's a good side on that as well, which is well, the resellers like myself, we have to make money from not just selling Windows or just selling Word or Office. It, it, we make money by supporting our clients, which is what I like anyways, right? So these security updates are intended to fix problems with security holes in Windows that could allow hackers access to your computers if they are left unpatched. Okay, so security updates are very important. You'll see those if you go into Windows updates on your computer separate. You'll see the security updates. You'll see the feature updates. Those are the other ones. So these are new features like the Edge browser getting changed, completely rewritten for the third time. Uh, Cortana, right? Which I don't, I don't know of anybody actually that uses Cortana. Microsoft is bringing back Clippy apparently. If you remember good old Clippy, many people are not Clippy fans, but they're bringing it back as part of their whole AI deal with OpenAI and ChatGPT. But they have a whole bunch of different stuff that they will be updating. And those are available for people who have the active subscription plan. And nowadays it's called Microsoft 365. It used to be called Office 365. You know, why not change it, uh, change the name? Microsoft already has 10,000 SKUs. What, what, what's another 10,000? Who cares? So those are the two main ones, right? The security updates, the feature updates. Security updates are the ones that you probably want to put on your computer. Feature updates, those are not necessary. Or you don't necessarily need all of the features. So you've got to pay closer attention to those. And that's part of what we're doing right now with the patch aware stuff is, okay, even with security updates, which ones are the ones that are the most critical to install? 
And we're going to tell you why, because there are potential problems with Windows updates, whether they're automatic or not. So to turn them on, if you're sitting in front of your Windows machine, you're going to open the settings app. You can just do a search for update and security. Then you go into Windows Update and click the Check for Updates button, and it'll check and it will do updates. Now, depending on the version of Windows that you have, the, the screen's going to look a little different. Plus, if you're using a home version of Windows, you're not going to have much flexibility on the whole update thing. Windows Home is going to install security updates pretty much when they're available, whether you want them to or not. I got a call from our law firm, and I, I find it a little hard to believe, but guess what? They were using, yeah, Windows Home Edition. So they called me up because at that 4 p.m. that day, and I think they called me about 2, they had some documents that had to be filed at the court. So why did they call me? Well, they called me at 2 because their computer decided it was going to do updates. Wanted to know, uh, you know, how do we stop the updates? Uh, and if it's in the middle of doing updates, turning it off could be a very bad thing, depending on, you know, exactly what it's doing at the time that you kill it. So you've got to be very careful. If you get into the professional versions of Windows, you have the ability to say, well, wait seven days, which isn't a bad idea, before you go ahead and install those updates because who knows what they break. And usually within a week or two, Microsoft has fixed the things that they broke uh, in their Windows update. Now, some things will take them a little while longer. So some of the programs that run on Windows that Microsoft broke, they might take, I, I've seen it take months sometimes to fix those. So that's where Microsoft has this rollback feature that you would need to look into if that was a problem for you. So what are the benefits of automatic Windows updates? I think we kind of went through them. It helps prevent the hackers from exploiting some of the vulnerabilities in the versions of Windows software. It can lead to data breaches, cyber attacks. It's going to help protect you somewhat against some of the phishing attacks where they're trying to get you to click on something. And then, of course, that'll download some software that's going to cause you all kinds of headaches. Second, the automatic updates are going to make it easier in a lot of businesses when it comes to the IT departments because they don't have to update each computer every month or do it manually, right? They just turn it on the feature and forget it, right? Set it and forget it, just like Ron Peel. So that can be good, but there's another side to that coin, right? Like most coins, first of all, you should consider data loss because if your computer's turned off or in sleep mode when an update is installed it might not be able to save any open files or open documents before it's restarting and this is also going to depend on what software you're using and how smart the software is so you could get data loss if your computer isn't in in a ups and your power goes out, right? That's just almost the same as turning it off when it's in the middle of a patch. Could be very, very bad, right? A slower performance. Most of the time, updates are going to improve your system speed, the overall performance, but some updates have been known to cause decreases in speed, sometimes dramatic decreases in speed, other times just slight decreases in speed. And so you've got to be careful. A lot of times the decreases in speed come from bloat, bloating software. So Microsoft programmers have gotten lazy and instead of worrying about, well, can we actually run in the four gigabytes minimum memory that we recommend for Windows? The answer is no. No, they can't. So they just keep getting bigger and bigger, requiring more and more memory. So if you notice slower performance after you've been doing some of these updates and upgrades, it may just need more memory. We were helping a customer out this week. He must have had 100 tabs open, I think Ella was telling me. And that, uh, you know, that's a problem too. That'll slow your computer down 
no question about it. Now, your computer might also be running slowly due to some other issues. We'll talk about those when we get back. And we've got quite a few other considerations here when it comes to updates. Make sure you get the newsletter. You'll find out about this stuff. You'll become patch aware. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. Yes, I fixed that page. So what are the other problems that you could have if you're doing Windows updates? And you know what? Some of this stuff doesn't just apply to Windows. Most of this applies to pretty much anything that you might be patching or updating. Important stuff. We've run through some of the reasons so far that you might want to update some reasons why you might not want to update. That's what we're on right now. So slower performance. I mentioned that over time, your computers can slow down. A lot of the reason for that is because the applications you're running, the operating system that you're running, gets bigger and bigger, wants more CPU, wants more memory. And that's why sometimes just upgrading the RAM or putting a faster disk in, maybe an SSD, replacing that spinning disk is really going to help as well. But there are some other potential problems that come that are exhibited by slower performance, and that includes infections, malware, viruses. Nowadays, it includes things like uh, crypto mining. I, I, I don't know if you heard me a few months ago, but I was talking about a school district in Mass, and down in Massachusetts, this guy had been, he had built a crypto mining system in a crawl space in the school and so the school was paying for the cooling for the crawl space the crypto mining operation was paying for the electricity for the crypto mining operation and uh, the guy was caught ultimately right but crypto mining can really slow your machine down and there have been problems with crypto mining on android devices as well so Keep an eye out for that. If your battery is just running down, like, like quick, 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 it might be crypto mining. And all you need for some of the crypto mining is JavaScript, which it can just run from a regular web page. So those are all things that you have to be careful of. Unexpected reboots. Now, this can be a problem, particularly in the Windows world, where it installs a patch and then reboots and then installs a patch and then reboots right and it goes through that cycle multiple times some applications really need to be closed so ideally what you should do is turn off if, if you're really going to be diligent okay i mean you, you got to pay attention but if turn off the automatic updates and then when patch tuesday comes around Wait about a week, and then once you've waited for that week, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go into your computer. You're going to close all of your applications, save all of your files, and then you're going to go in and say, okay, do Windows Update. Does that make sense? Because uh, this whole reboot, an unexpected reboot, it could really mess up your work, okay? So it's not a bad way to do it, but if you're not super diligent about going in and manually running the updates, just leave automatic updates on. Now, if you're running a 64-bit version of Windows and have automatic updates enabled, it's possible that some updates could cause your system to become unstable or even crash. And they could cause incompatibility problems with some of your applications as well. Outdated drivers, the bane of everybody's existence that has ever tried to, you know, install Windows or update Windows. Because remember, we were talking about the drivers. These are the programs that let your computer communicate with the hardware, things like your printers, scanners, keyboards. If you don't have the latest version installed in your system, you could really experience some problems when you're using certain devices or applications. Unwanted changes are a problem with updates because some updates are designed to change how a program works. 
I, I was talking about it earlier, depending on the version of Windows, you're going to find this menu here or might be there or they might have renamed it or Microsoft's 10,000 plus SKUs, right? So these programs, when they're changed or when the operating system is changed and there's different OS calls or maybe there's API calls into the cloud, that could really break some programs that you rely on. For example, if you've got Microsoft Word and you're using it for writing letters and documents, but you find out suddenly it's been updated and it now has features for web design, which it does, <laughs> Really? Word? Okay. But it does. You'll need to learn how to use new features before you continue your work. And those new features might be buggy and cause problems with features you're normally using, right? It's, this is, it's, it's a tough world. Data loss, loss of functionality. The list kind of goes on and on. I've got it all in my newsletter. It's all on my website. If you go to craigpeterson.com, just scroll down on the home page, find automatic updates, the hero we all need. And I, I go through all of this stuff there and some of the nightmares. So if you're not sure, it's really best to wait until after business hours or maybe on a weekend when you have more time to recover from any issues that may arise. You also want to make sure that your computer is backed up before you do an update. And that way you, you, you're pretty sure you're not going to lose any important files or data if anything goes wrong during the process. So keep an eye on all of that stuff. So all of this was covered in my newsletter. And it's important, really is, to get it. It's a free newsletter. This is the free one, right? This isn't the paid one. This is the free newsletter, and I've got the Patch Aware stuff in there, and I really want everybody to pay close attention to it. And I'm going to keep this up. We're going to tell you what you should be patching every week and when there's some critical stuff that's out there. And I'm thinking about making another email list that's specifically about patches. And if you'd like to be on that email list, uh, email me. I, I want to know if it's worth my time, right? Uh, because this stuff takes hours to do every week. And I'm glad to put the time in. But if no one's going to use it, uh, you know, it's it's really hard. It's, it's hard on for me, hard on the marriage, hard on everything else, right? So let me know. Me at craigpeterson.com. Would you like to be on the Patch Aware mailing list where we're giving you more details see my, my general mailing list yeah yeah you're going to get some of that stuff but the patch aware mailing list is is where the action is really happening now we've got some interesting uh, articles in the newsletter as well this week about ai so we'll be getting into those i'd also like to get a little feedback from you guys about the newsletter I have changed it. It's still where I'm going through. I'm finding some of the best articles online, ones that I think are really going to impact our lives, and putting them in its curated articles. But if you've noticed the last few weeks, I'm no longer just pulling some verbiage out of the articles. I am writing a few paragraphs about the article and what my th summary of that article is. You still can click through to whoever it is. And I, I, I've got everybody, you know, Ars Technica, Time Magazine, all the way through uh, more right-leaning and centrist places because tech... When it comes to tech, politics shouldn't matter. Let me just put it that way. So what do you think of that? Do you like what I've been writing here in the newsletter? And I, I'd love to hear from you. I love to hear the appreciation. It makes it more worthwhile, that's for sure. Just me at craigpeterson.com. If there is a topic that you'd like me to cover in the newsletter or on the radio show, by all means, just go ahead and drop me a line as well. Just again, Craig at Craig Peter, me at CraigPeterson.com. I know I can talk, man. It has been one of those weeks. Has it been one of those weeks for you too? Man, it seems like half of everything is going wrong this week. Oh, man. All right, so stick around. We're going to talk about the latest in AI and a new term, confabulation. You might not be familiar with that, but man, you need to know what it is. 
I've got a new word for you, confabulation. This is a real world word, and it's one we're actually all familiar with. If you've ever talked to a four-year-old or heard President Biden speak, and now AI is in that same realm. Well, I said in my newsletter, the AI chat box apocalypse is on us, folks. This is really a great bad time, I guess, to be alive. We're, we're seeing so many changes. I, my father passed away at the end of last year, and it really made me think a little bit about my grandparents and, of course, my father and all the things they saw over the course of their uh, more than 80 years, 85 years, and over 90 in uh, one case. They've seen a lot, but I think we are seeing even more. Just this whole thing with ChatGPT, with the AIs from OpenAI and some of these other companies that are out there. Bing Chat, of course, which is based on OpenAI, Google's Bard, and some of the others. We've talked before about how some of these chatbots that were intended to be used to help people who have loneliness, maybe need a little psychological help or support, actually drove people to commit suicide. Okay, It's a really bad thing. So there's a great article that I had in my newsletter, and this is uh, up uh, do I no I guess we're not putting it up on my website anymore you got to get the newsletter in order to see these things uh, because I just don't have enough time but um, chat GPT and these other AIs are great at making things up and this is uh, why I mentioned the four-year-olds or President Biden right you listen to four-year-old they, they might start a story out with actual facts And then they fill up the whole middle with stuff that they've made up, right? And uh, then they might end it with something that's right. Now, some people have termed this hallucinations, that the uh, mistakes, if you will, that these large language models are using to generate responses to you are hallucinations, right? They're obviously mistakes. But the term in human psychology is called confabulation. So confabulation occurs when someone's memory has a gap and the brain convincingly fills in the rest without necessarily intending to deceive others. Now, ChatGPT does not work like the human brain. It is not intelligent, okay? Calling it an AI, if you ask me, is a misnomer, okay? But the term confabulation, I think, serves as a better metaphor because there's this whole creative gap-filling principle that we humans have and that we humans use at work here. And it's a very, very big problem because these AI bots are generating false information that can potentially mislead, can, can hurt people who are depressed, might hurt you in some sort of a diagnosis, right? Going to Dr. Google, well, how about going to Dr. OpenAI or ChatGPT, right? All of these things could be problems. Now, the Washington Post recently reported on this law professor who discovered ChatGPT had placed him on a list of legal scholars who had sexually harassed someone. But that's never happened. ChatGPT completely made it up. I played around a little bit with it as well, and I asked it about me. Who is Craig Peterson? And it, it really uh, kind of inflated my credentials, which was quite something. Uh, you know, it inflated them by saying, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a popular speaker. Well, yeah, people, any place that I've ever spoken, they really liked it. But, you know, I'm not speaking every week or even every month most of the time because I'm just too busy taking care of problems for people. So it, it's a problem. So... There is, uh, here's another one. An Australian mayor who allegedly found that ChatGPT claimed he had been convicted of bribery and sentenced to prison 
also complete fabrication. And there have been lawsuits launched against the company, OpenAI, because of this sort of thing. So people have been proclaiming the end of the search engine. We had Google declare a code red at the beginning of 2023 because of the potential conflict here. People were saying, who's going to use the search engine anymore? We're just going to use ChatGPT. Well, you know, that's true eventually, but it's not true now. And, and I want you guys to remember the term confabulation. It's making stuff up. The ChatGPT has invented books and studies that don't exist, publications that professors didn't write, fake academic papers, false legal citations. It kind of sounds like uh, Congress, doesn't it? Non-existent Linux system features, unreal retail mascots, and technical details that don't make any sense. So here's a guy who posted this on Twitter. Curious how chat GPT will replace Google if it gives wrong answers with high confidence. And isn't that part of the problem, the high confidence? For example, I asked ChatGPT to give a list of top books on social cognitive theory. Out of the 10 books on the answer, four books don't exist, and three books were written by different people. So he, he shows a picture here of the, of the responses. A book doesn't exist. Here's one of them. The Handbook of Social Cognitive Theories and Neutral Mechanisms, edited by Brian Ross and Klaus Fiedler. Sounds legit, doesn't it? Here's another one doesn't exist. Uh, Social Cognitive Neuroscience, an introduction by John Cap Cap Capiopo, I guess, and Gary Bernstein. Another one that doesn't exist. Cognitive Social Psychology, the Social Cognitive Neuroscience of Leadership. And it's attributing these all to authors. And then there's three other books on this list of 10 that do exist, but it is being attributed to authors that don't exist. Okay, so this predilection for f fibbing counterintuitively, really, and it's why we're talking about confabulation here. Now, ChatGPT is an obvious improvement over the vanilla GPT-3. I've been using GPT-3.5. I've been using um, GPT March 2023. There's another version of it. And of course, GPT-4, playing with this stuff for a couple of years now. But the newer versions of ChatGPT refuse to answer some questions or let you know when answers might not be accurate. So here's a quote. Okay, this is from Scale AI. A, a major factor in Chat's success is that it manages to suppress confabulation enough to make it unnoticeable for many common questions. Compared to its predecessors, ChatGPT is notably less prone to making things up. That's Riley Goodside, is an expert in large language models over at Scale AI. So if it's used as a brainstorming tool, which is how I've been using it now, Karen's been using it, I know a lot of other people using it, a brainstorming tool, a writing assistant, ChatGPT's logical leaps and confabulations might lead to some creative breakthroughs, frankly. It'll get you past the writer's block that everybody has that's ever had to write anything, right? But you cannot use it as a factual reference. OpenAI knows that. OpenAI knows that ChatGPT can cause some real harm out there for, for anyone who's using it. So be careful. It's ChatGPT is incredibly limited. And that's, by the way, a quote from OpenAI CEO. But it's good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. It's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important right now. It's a preview of progress. We have lots of work to do on robustness and truthfulness. And in a later tweet, according to Ars Technica, he wrote, It does know a lot, but the danger is that it is confident and wrong 
at the same time, a significant fraction of the time. So be very careful. Check it out. Use it. It's going to help you, I think, in a lot of ways. And there's a lot more detail in this article, and you can just follow this in from my newsletter. And it talks a lot about the confabulation. So there's really only one question that matters with AI, and this is from Time Magazine. Uh, frankly, AI is risking democracy. Uh, absolutely is. The Future of Life Institute has really sparked a, a debate, fiery debate, frankly, with a petition, folks, that's demanding a six-month halt on AI experiments. I've talked about this a couple of times on the air before as well. So these tech whizzes are warning of apocalyptic consequences if developers don't hit the brakes. Now, a lot of opponents are split, but big names are chiming in. And uh, there was a letter signed, co-signed by, I think it was 300 leading Silicon Valley people that are saying, yeah, uh, we've we got to be careful about this. Well, we sure do. But let's talk about reality. If you're a company and you're trying to gain a competitive advantage or even maintain an advantage that you have, you are all on top of AI. You have to be, just like Google with its code red because of OpenAI and what it was able to do. So are you going to sit on your hands for six months? This letter is calling for there, there to be no development on any AI that's better than ChatGPT4. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to continue to work on it, pump out new stuff, and use us as guinea pigs for all of the latest creations. You're already seeing it. And if, if you want to play for free with one of these, just go online to a website called you.com, Y-O-U.com, and they're tied into OpenAI. They do, it's a search engine, they do regular searches, but they will also provide you with all kinds of, uh, you know, AI responses if you want them. You, Y-O-U.com. Make sure you get my newsletter. You've got to be patch aware. And that's part of my newsletter every week. I'd love to know what you think of the newsletter. Just hit reply. Let me know about the new way we have started laying things out and all of the new summaries I've been writing as well. Take care. CraigPeterson.com.